Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 How are you today? Glad you're here. If you're joining us online, welcome. We are part in a series called Change Your World. And the way we change the world is by changing our world. You know, God has given us opportunities to do that with people in our lives. And it happens one person at a time where we just connect with somebody. We use our influence. We're kind of listening to the Holy Spirit, allowing him to kind of use us to influence other people. And it's a great opportunity to do that. And the Bible says that we are to do that. That's part of our mission. It's part of our assignment that we're supposed to step into that. If you look at what Jesus said when he first got together with his disciples, as he said, uh, he says, hey, I want, I'm going to make something special out of you. I'm going to, you know, he coalesced him. He said, I'm going to make, I'm going to change you. I'm going to make you different. Now, if you didn't know the story, and I know a lot of you do, but if you didn't know the story, you'd, you'd, you might wonder, well, what is Jesus going to make him into? What's he going to change him into? I mean, is he going to make them rich, famous? Is he going to make them good husbands and good wives? Is he going to make them more spiritual? Is he going to make them, uh, you know, what, what is he going to do? Well, here's what Jesus says. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you, here's what he's going to make him, fishers of men. Fishers of men. Now, that was a colloquial for their day because some of them were fishermen, and they all knew fishermen. We're certainly a fishing community here, and fishers of men means you have an assignment. You're supposed to do something with your life. Before, they were just fishing for fish. Now, God's given them a bigger capacity to see, hey, it's not just about my vocation. It's not just about taking care of me. But God's given me an assignment to look around and to be part of what God's doing around me. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a fisher. You, you fish. You're a fisher person, fisherman, fisherwoman, whatever. I mean, you're involved in that. And so we see that at the very beginning, Mark 1, this is kind of a book, the very end, right before Jesus goes to heaven, look at, he says this, he says, Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere in the world. So he says, what I've been teaching you for the last three and a half years, all, I want you to share that now. Go all over your world, impact the world around you, and tell the good news to everybody. And we need that. We need that more than ever today. You know, good news is in short supply. And with the world being connected through the internet and through television, all I mean, we hear about bad news all the time. So many people are suffocating in bad news. And the world is hard anyways. Life is difficult. So there's a lot of bad news. And he says, hey, I'm offering good news to everybody. And that's great. I'm glad that was our assignment. I mean, it didn't have to go down that way, right? We could have been charged with like bad news or something. But I'm so glad we get to share good news. Good news to everybody. I was praying this morning about talking to you and, and this message, and obviously I'm speaking on sharing your faith. And I thought, you know, I know some people, they think, they get so uh, self-conscious about that and anxious, and they feel like, hey, this is outside of my wheelhouse, and I'm not very good at it. And I felt like the Lord has a word for some of you, and that's that God wants you just to increase your joy, that you have good news to share. That is so attractive. So, you know, listen, people, they'll, they'll ask you questions. Why are you so happy? Why do you have peace in that situation? What's going on in your life? If you increase your joy, and joy is a choice. We, we, taught, we did a whole series on it at the end of last year about choosing joy. You get to choose that. And that will be one of the greatest ways that you can share your faith. So how do you share your faith? I mean, what, what goes into that? Well, if you think of like an evangelist, 
You know, typically, we, we, some, for most of us, we have kind of negative connotations with an evangelist, right? If you were thinking of adjectives that go along with evangelist, you might think, uh, you know, obnoxious. I mean, for me, I think to myself, evangelist, I think, well, that's, I think that's the guy, he like wears a three-piece white suit with flashy shoes, bling all over, you know, kind of, a, you know, screaming at you, probably pointing his finger, right? I mean, that's not very, you know endearing. Yet, if you were to think of the person who is most influential in your life for putting your faith in Christ, for making a spiritual decision for the Lord, what, would, what adjectives would come to your mind of that person who did that? Probably you'd think, well, that person was patient with me. They were kind. They were inviting. They were caring. But somehow along, somehow along the way, now evangelism or evangelist or evangelical is associated with being pushy, bullying, uh, you know, this right-wing fanatic. I mean, there's all these negative things. But that's not what God asks us to do. In fact, if you look at what God asks us to do, is he gives it very specifically. He says this. He says, you will be my witnesses. Witnesses. Uh, that's kind of like a courtroom uh, metaphor. You've seen movies about courtrooms. There's Different people have different jobs there. You have like a prosecutor and a defense attorney. And he goes, hey, you don't have any of that. You're a witness. You're not, your job's not to go tell people they're going to hell or, or to try to argue their way in. Or you, you have all of the answers to every biblical question they have or every life situation they have. No, he goes, you, you, you're a witness. You just tell, hey, this is what God did to me. This is my experience with how God intersected my life, what he's done, how he's changed my life. And he says to Jerusalem and Judea, because Jerusalem was the city they were in, Judea was the region, Samaria was cross-cultural. He goes, even to the end of the earth. He goes, there's no limits, but your job, be very clear, you're a witness. You're a witness. You just share, hey, this is what God's doing in my life. I like that because it brings it down to where, hey, I can do that. I can do that. This past Monday, I was, uh, I was out at the beach, a uh, chick's beach. I took my dog out there and uh, let her go running around, sniffing people. She actually loves it, running in, the, in this waves. I ended up talking to this, this gal. Her name was Lynn, and, and as, I didn't know her, but we were just talking, and it turns out she had a real rough year. She, you know, she had some significant losses in her life, and she didn't have a church she belonged to. She didn't have the encouragement in her life. So I... You know, I'm listening to all that, and there's kind of like my opportunity to, to, to do something, to be a witness. Hey, this is what God did in my life. I want to invite you to, you know, why don't you try my church? And so I did. I just said, hey, have you ever heard of the vineyard? And I kind of told her where it's at. She goes, oh, my daughter is, uh, you know, throughout her teenage years, she used to go to the youth group there a lot. She loved it. She goes, I, I might try it. And just an opportunity. You will have opportunities to be a witness. Barna, and uh, they're one of the, they're like Gallup. They do the surveys. I was looking at it this week. And they were saying that people that are unchurched, if you invite them to church, 20% are eagerly waiting for somebody to invite them. 20%. 50% would, would seriously consider coming. So you have 50% of the people that are not going to church, not involved, would consider coming if we were just to invite them. That's a, that's, those are opportunities to be a witness and to share and to talk. It says, preach the word of God. You go, Andy, that's your job. No, no. That's our job. We're to preach. Now, it looks different from each person, you know, but you, you, be, you be you. That's what you're good at. And doesn't mean you're perfect, but you know whatever you know, whatever, wherever you're at in your stage, and you preach the word of God. He says, be prepared whether the times are favorable or not. Sometimes they are more favorable than others, right? Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. That, he says, that's your ministry. That's, that's, Andy, I want something more. No, that's it. That's, that's it. God wants, he says, that's what he has for you. Sometimes when I talk about things like evangelism. People go, you know, Andy, can't you speak on something more, you know, more deep? Go deep. Which means confusing, right? You know, what was it about? I don't know, but it was deep. It means it's just confusing. Well, here's something deep. Live the Bible, don't just read it. Live the Bible out. 
That's what we're supposed to do. When you're talking to somebody who's in a difficult place in their life, they're, uh, maybe they are gone through some kind of trauma or, ch- or crisis, they don't need to know the Greek word for life raft. They just need you to help them get in one. You know, they need, they need you to help them. So that's, so that's part of our job as we, we come alongside. Now, it's really, there's kind of like a, a, a four-part methodology to this. And it's real simple. I want you to, to know this so that you can be effective in sharing your faith. And so let's look at that. First of all is, is become aware. Becoming aware is really important. Just kind of an awareness of the people around you and what they're going through, but also an awareness of that's part of what I need to do, that God doesn't have a plan B. I'm supposed to be that person. He rarely goes directly to a person. He uses other people, and that's part of what our job is. I mentioned the Barna survey I was looking at. I thought it was interesting. Part of the Barna survey was talking, it had grouped it into uh, age groups, and here, here it's up on the side screen, is generational differences on faith sharing. And it says, in the, you see, you, you have the millennials, Gen X, boomers, elders, or the seniors, right? And so it, w- notice at the very top it says, hey, part of my faith means I need to be a witness. And you can see pretty much across the board everybody's saying, yeah, we get that. And these are, this is a survey for Christians. But if you drop down to the one, two, three, four, the fourth one, it says, I am gifted at sharing my faith with others. Now notice how high how much higher uh, the millennials are than others, which I thought was pretty cool. I thought, wow, millennials, they really get it. They feel like, hey, I can share my faith until you look at the next line down. Look at it, it says, most millennials believe, or at least half believe, it's wrong to share their faith. So they're good at it, but they don't do it because it's wrong. Now, obviously, that's not from the Bible. That perception is because there's an attitude that has been in our culture that has been created that, that is very uh, resistant to the Christian faith. And so it's kind of like, oh, you're, you're judging me or, or all kinds of things that they put on that. But the Bible's very clear, regardless of how old you are, that not only are we supposed to share and be a witness, we're supposed to share that when, it's, when we have those opportune times. Now, obviously, sometimes there's not opportune times. But God often, if you're looking for him, they'll come across your pathway all of the time. So that's part of becoming aware. Another part of becoming aware is just recognizing that God is involved in, 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 in this process. Not everybody's in the same spot. And so knowing, hey, I have uh, a place in, in, in God's bigger plan in somebody's life. We're not always leading somebody to Christ. I mean, sometimes we're, well, here's how Paul said it. He said, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. So certainly he's going to use us. Now, here's what Paul said. He goes, my work was to plant the seed. So he says, sometimes that's our job. That's what we're doing. We're planting seeds in somebody's heart. You know, we're sharing a word that's timely, something God did on us. But they don't, that's kind of all that happens there. Somebody else, he says, in this case, it was Apollos. Another guy came along and he watered it. It's a metaphor. He's saying some people uh, are planting, some people are watering. He goes, but ultimately God then comes and gives it growth. And then the whole garden grows. So he says, God's involved in this, but he uses people at different stages. There's something called the Engel scale that I came across years ago. James Engel, he, he, he kind of uh, teased this out a little more. And he said, hey, what I see, because he, he'd done a lot of evangelism, lots of uh, uh, worked with a lot of, of people that had shared their faith and, and really studied kind of at a sociological level of how people kind of progress into becoming followers. And so here is what he said. Is he said people often start at minus five. They're resistant. They're just not even open to it. They don't want to hear it. Often this person who's at a, at a minus five who's resistant they are, they're hurt, or they, uh, they're in pain. There's, there's deep disappointment. Sometimes they're very angry with, maybe hurt uh, with by a church or a Christian. And, they, and, and, and so they've just kind of closed up, and they've just, hey, I'm, I'm not interested at all. A few years ago, I had uh, somebody, we were talking, some lady, and she uh, asked me about my profession, my vocation. I said, well, I'm a pastor. And she goes, oh. She goes, I don't, I don't like Christians. I said, oh, dang, it's me too. 
I go, I don't like them. Here, fist bump. You know, yeah, I don't like them. That's why I had to start my own church of ones that I liked. <laughs> now, now, I'm kind of just playing with her a little bit. But there's some truth, right? But now I realize somebody there, I'm, that's not, I'm probably not going to see them step over the line of faith that moment that day. I'm trying to help her become a little more receptive. And so that is kind of my goal. So see, I knew at that point, I'm helping somebody go from resistant to receptive. Hey, maybe they're not all like that. Maybe I can let my guard down a little bit. Maybe God, you know, is in this. I just want them to kind of move. And that would be then minus four was receptive. Now people become more receptive often through difficult things in life. You know, financial crisis, a marital crisis, some other relational crisis, maybe with their kid or, you know, at work, maybe a, a vocational thing that's going on. Maybe their health is deteriorating, uh, or maybe an addiction thing that's kind of coming unhinged. Uh, all kinds of things happen to cause people to realize, maybe I can't do this on my own. Maybe I need additional help. And so people become more, more receptive, more receptive. And, uh, and it's true that ultimately when, we, when life throws us curveballs, we become, we, we, we do need help. We become more aware it's not all about us. And so we start to seek. And that's the next, that would be the next level where, hey, I'm, you know, maybe there's something more to this thing. And these become, they become, their attitude starts to shift. And, and, and especially if they've been in a problem for a long time, they're miserable. They're thinking, I can't take this any longer. I need Something to change here. Something's got to shift. And, and life does have difficult things that come our way. And, it's, and if that's you, I'm, I want you to know God cares about your situation. You know, he, he does. If you're in pain, God cares about you. And, 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 he, and he, his heart aches over that. It does. And, but, and, and so he's really seeking you. But that's, we're, we're staying with the angle scale here. But the seeker, we're, they start to really seek. And then there's a point where they start to get understanding. Sometimes they just need a little clarity now, somebody to kind of, you know, tease it out. I had a guy come up to me uh, once, and he said, Andy, uh, it was at the end of a service. He goes, I didn't, I didn't receive Christ. I just want you to know, I, I still smoke pot. I get stoned all the time. I get wasted. I, I get drunk, and I'm not interested in giving that up. I said, hey, that's not a problem. I said, God's not interested in making you holy. I said, God is interested in having a relationship with you. He goes, well, what about all that stuff I'm doing? I said, you're always going to be dealing with something. I go, when God's ready, he'll deal with that. I said, but that's not the issue. The issue is, do you, do you want to receive Christ? Do you want his help in life and go through things? See, he just needed some understanding, and then he received Christ. Subsequently, just to let you know, he, didn't, he did change his lifestyle in those areas. But he's still, I'm sure he's still struggling with something. Oh, don't we all? But it's understanding he needed some help to kind of, okay, I get the next. And once they unlock that, then they're ready. And when somebody's ready, they don't need more argumentation or something. They just need an invitation. They need, they need some help. How, what do I need to do now to take that step? Uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, I was talking to this guy. I kind of entered into this discipleship thing with him. He was not a believer. He was way, way up here and probably resistant in a lot of ways. He was pretty, uh, pretty firm. He said, hey, I don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. I don't believe in the Trinity. I don't believe, I believe he was just a man who lived, a moral teacher. He's, he, he died. It's over. That's, he goes, that's where I stand, and I'm not interested in anything else. So that's where it started. And, uh, and so I had a chance to meet with him regularly, and we talked, and we talked, and I, he slowly became more open to hearing about what God was doing in his life and kind of seeing that and getting that. And then finally, after about a year, uh, he was ready. He said, you know, Andy, he goes, I now believe uh, that Jesus is the son of God, that he died for me on the cross and that, that you know, and, uh, and that he's, that I believe in the Trinity, that he's, that he's in the God, that he's God. And so he's ready. You say, well, no, he's a Christian. No, he's ready. If I just left, I don't know what would have happened. He's ready. He needs somebody to now help him take that next step, which is through prayer, where you confess it. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Christ, then you will be saved. He needed to confess it. He needed to say that to God. He needed to step into that door of actually opening up conversation with the creator of, 
of, of heaven and earth. And so I said to him, would you like to pray that? He goes, well, I don't know how to do that. I said, I'll lead you in a prayer. Real simple. Just help them to, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in you, God. Thank you for sending your son. I asked for forgiveness. He started that conversation. He, made, he was ready, but he then became a new life in Christ. So that next step, that's an important part. Some of you, you might be here. saying, yeah, it's kind of, I've never really taken that step. Well, this would be your service, and this is the moment for you, where you say, okay, I, I need to pray that. I need to actually say that. I've heard you pray that. I just listen. Or maybe you check your phone. I don't know what you do. You know, but, you know, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually do that. And then it doesn't end there, actually. You continue to grow. Belonging. That's the next step for a Christ follower. I belong to something. You're birthed into a family. And, you, and, and God does things through teams called the local church. And so you need to be part of a church. This is a lot of good churches. This is not the only church. Uh, I could recommend 10 great churches for you to, to belong to in this area. I believe one, one of those 10 is us. We're a great church. But we're not the only one, and you certainly are welcome to be part of it. But you need to belong and say, yeah, that's going to be my place where I connect in. And you need to be involved in a small group where people know you by name. They know what you're going through. They can pray for you. They encourage you and vice versa. And then belonging is part of it. Then growing. Growing is, in other words, discovery, where you say, hey, uh, I want to figure out what God has for me and how I'm supposed to play that role in the bigger picture. I'm supposed to be part of something, doing something with God and, and, and his team. And that's why we offer Growth Track. Growth Track is to help you with that. Today is step one. Step one's the very beginning part. It's four steps. Each one's about a little less than an hour, about 50 minutes. We feed you. We watch your kids. We try to make it easy. But we're trying to come alongside you and say, hey, this is important. It's time for you to grow. And some of you have not done that. You've been around for a while. You've heard about Growth Track. And something always comes up. Listen, it's not, we, just to let you know, uh, two years ago, it, the class used to be three hours. <laughs> three, all three of them were three hours. That was a big commitment. We thought, you know, maybe that's too big. You know, let's, let's, so some of you are going, yeah, I'm so glad I waited, you know. <laughs> it's, it's 50 minutes, right? So we really, you know, brought it down. So growing is really important. Then the next is, is serving. Serving. Now we're doing serve day coming up on the 13th this Saturday. A great opportunity for you to serve. And it doesn't make sense. You're not serving yourself. You're not serving people you know who can pay you back, who can reward you back. Hey, that's really cool. I'm going to reward. No, they're going to be like, I don't even know you. You're a stranger. Why are you here? I'm just here to serve. Wow. That's so, you'll have, see, this is a great opportunity for you to do something like that and make a big impact. Do something to serve others. It's a big part of what we do as Christ followers. Jesus said, I came to serve. And we saw that demonstrated in his life. Now, for some of you, not everybody, but for some of you, this coming Saturday when you serve will be the most spiritual thing you do all year. The most spirit, it's nothing small. The most spiritual thing, you, not everybody, but some of you, because it's going to break loose something. You see, when you, it's not until you start serving and you start getting on God's plan when you really start to experience what God has for you. God speaks to you. He reveals things to you. He uses you in powerful ways. He, he, all kinds of things happen and unlock in your life when you start getting on his plan. And a big part of that is serving and then sharing. Sharing is another part where that's just, you're, you realize, hey, that's, I'm up. I'm up to bat. I'm an ambassador for Christ. God wants to use me in this area. And listen, when you serve this Saturday, because it's so out of the box, so unusual, when you serve, you, almost everybody here will get an opportunity to be a witness, to share. They're going to ask you, why are you doing this? Boom. You know, you're going to say, hey, this is why. And because God did something in my life, I want to be able to express the love of God in our community, or however you would say it. Big part of that is, so this is, this is our, part of our responsibility. Uh, Sam Williams said this, evangelism is helping people discover how God is already at work in their lives. God's already at work. He's doing stuff. Some people have planted. Some people have watered. Some crisis has come and softened and tilled up the earth and made, it, you know, made them more receptive. Or maybe they're seeking or maybe they, you know, they, they've gotten some understanding. All kinds of things. But we play a role and you play a part. And you just, God, 
Help me to see the part I play. So first is you need to be aware of what's going on. Number two is prayer. Prayer is an important part. Prayer, this is not uh, just of this earth. There's a spiritual element, spiritual element. And you have to, there's a kind of a battle that's going on. Now, listen, and I want you to look at me. Listen, some of you have a loved one, maybe a husband or a wife, who is far from God. They're lost. They're not close to God. Uh, Maybe you have a wayward son or a daughter, and your heart yearns for them to know the Lord, to be close. Or maybe it's a neighbor or a friend or a coworker, and you think about them all the time, and and your, your passion is there, your compassion is there, but... You're, you know, you're just kind of, what do I do? Here's, I want to give you five things to pray over them. Okay, pray scripture over them. Five things to pray over them. Write their names down. And then regularly pray uh, these verses over them. The first one, pray that the Father would draw them to Jesus. Because Jesus said that it's the Father who draws people to Jesus. And so you want to be making that part of your prayer. God, draw them. Draw them to the Lord. Help Carve out any path that way that needs to happen. And then the second thing you pray is, is pray against the, the spirit of the God of this world that blinds their minds. And you can read that verse. There's actually this, a God of this world that, that keeps people blinded. The apostle Paul, when he came to Christ, he actually literally was blinded. And after a few days, scales came off of his eyes. And so that's... It's not literal like that for a lot of people, but it's, they're just as blind. They don't get it at all. And you can sit there and argue with them and have some of the greatest uh, uh, discussions and you get frustrated and nothing happens because there's prayer that needs to happen to kind of break it up and to bind that spirit. Then pray that they come to know God relationally. So the, here this Roman says that there's the spirit of adoption. Or another translation calls it the spirit of sonship. And he's calling us into a relationship with him. A relationship. That's not just, I know God, but I know the Father. The Father in heaven. Jesus said, that's how we should be praying. Our Father in heaven. We, there's a relationship. We're connected. You know, there's religious people, Jesus says, that they're holy, they're religious, that will not go to heaven. And they're going to, like, at the gates of heaven, they're going to be arguing, Lord, Lord, didn't we call you, Lord, and do miracles in your name? And he's going to say, I never knew you. What, what is he saying? He's saying, knowing is the key. Do you know God? Do you know him personally? And then pray that believers will cross their paths and enter into positive relationships with them. So you pray, I want them to be connected to somebody who, who represents Christ well, you know, like if you have a son or a daughter and you're, you know, they're, and you, you say, well, they're not listening to me, Lord. They don't listen to their mother or their father. And you say, God, bring somebody cool in their life. You know, a cool Christian, somebody who reps you well, you know, somebody life giving, somebody who's not weird because there's some weird Christians out there. Right. And that's happened. You know, I mean, when you're like, I, I w- when I've been sharing my faith with people and sometimes I've sowed lots of time into them and then somebody else who claims to be a Christian, I don't know if they are or not, but they're just weird and they're like undoing in seconds what I've done, you know, in months or years. And I'm thinking, oh, just shut up, you know, just go away. (laughs) You're not helping the situation at all. And sometimes I've had the privilege to be the person who's like an answer to prayer. I'll be talking to them and maybe it's just at a restaurant and it's a server or just something like a quick interchange or, or, or I, I'm on a bus, I share a bus seat or something like that, an airplane seat. And they'll say, you know what? My mother has been praying for me and I can't believe you're near me, you know? And I, you know what I think? I'm the answer to that prayer because I'm cool. <laughs> That's a little obnoxious, I know, but okay. You got the idea. Pray for a revelation of who Jesus is and what he has done for them. You see, this thing happens spiritually in the end. When, the, when all is said and done, after all the, the plowing and the sowing and the watering, the eureka moment happens when the spirit of wisdom and revelation turns the light on in their mind and in their heart, and they get it. I get it. And some of you, that's what God's doing in your life. Maybe even right now when you're listening, yeah, I'm starting to figure it out. Yeah, I get it. 
I see where I'm at. Yeah, I need to take that next step. God does that. God does that. And so we want to be praying for that. Lord, help that to happen. Help that to happen. So we, prayer is obviously a big part of it. Then show you care. You show you care. People don't really know. They don't care what you know until they know how much you care. They want to know you care about them. Jesus demonstrates this so beautifully with a guy. Uh, he's uh, traveling uh, somewhere, right? And there's this guy named Zacchaeus. He's a tax collector. Now, that today is just an average profession. But back then, it was, it was like a terrible profession. You were like, like despised. Because in the, the, what the Romans did, the Roman government, is they would hire local people. And so in this case, Jews. They would hire Jews to tax other Jews. And then they would give them a detachment of soldiers. They would say, anybody who gives you a hard time, we have these soldiers, they'll do whatever you say. And so he would actually, most of the tax collectors would do like shakedowns. And they would just take, and they, the, the, the Romans would just say, we just want this amount. Any more you can get from them, that's yours. So not only were they supporting the tyranny of the Roman oppression, but also here it is, they're betraying their own people, and then they're doing shakedowns, taking their, taking their, 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 their material goods, uh, harassing them, and they're getting rich off it. And so they were despised. They were like the worst of the worst in their, in their culture. So Jesus ends up having this interaction showing he cared about that guy I just described. His name's Zacchaeus. As Jesus was passing through Jericho, a man named Zacchaeus, one of the most influential Jews in the Roman tax collecting business. In other words, he not only was a tax collector, he was over other tax collectors. And of course, a very rich man tried to get a look at Jesus. So he obviously is kind of in this receptive or seeker place where he's thinking, hey, I want to see Jesus. I want to know more. But he was too short to see over the crowds. So he ran ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree, a fig tree. So he's kind of smart, right? He's thinking, hey, if I get there, they all seem to be going that direction. I'll be able to see him uh, beside the road and watch them from there. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said. People love it when you call them by name. I mean, it shows you care. When you're willing to learn somebody's name, you're going, Andy, you're not doing a very good job. You, how, you don't call me by name very much. Well, I'm, I, there's actually... A, a lot of people here, and I invite you to tell, when, if you greet me and I don't say your name, I just, you can just tell me your name, okay? And, and here's the thing, I know my name, so you don't have to say, hey, Andy, just tell me your name, right? And I would love to know your name. It's, I care, and that's important to me. And so, but he obviously, maybe a word of knowledge, maybe somebody told him, I'm not sure, but he says his name, and then he says, Jesus goes on, he goes, quick, come down, for I am going to be a guest in your home today. Boy, what a bombshell. He's, he's going to go into his home, and he's going to have lunch with him. He's going to, like, hang out with this guy. I mean, in their minds, that, that was, like, the worst. I, how can you do that? Like today. I mean, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us today, but today, if, if you were to find out some celebrity was going to go and hang out and spend an evening or a, a lunch uh, at, their, at a home of a neo-Nazi uh, or a, of, a ra- of a known racist or just, you know, you just go, what's up with that, you know? So, and that's kind of the visceral response they're getting. They're going, this guy, he's a crook. He's like the worst. He, he just took my money last week. You know, he took a bunch of my money. And so the crowd, they were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, this is a little while later, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, Sir, from now on, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. So think, sir, just something's changing, right? He's starting to, hey, uh, the seeking thing has moved now from seeking to finding. He's going, and I, if I find I have overcharged anyone on his taxes, which is probably everyone, I will penalize myself by giving him back four times as much. That's called repentance. See, sometimes I think that's, that's underrated in our culture. It's all about forgiveness. Oh, God, forgive me. Yeah, but what about all these people I shafted? Well, fresh start for me, I guess. <laughs> he goes, no, I'm going to get things right. If I've hurt people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I can and make it real clear it's not business as usual. Jesus told him, this shows that salvation has come 
to this home today. This man was one of the lost sons of Abraham. And I, the Messiah, have come to search for and to save such souls as his. His life was changed because somebody cared to know his name, to interrupt his busy schedule for him, to go and have lunch with him when everybody else thought that was a terrible idea. He, had, he suffered derision, everything else. And then lastly, be ready to share. That's part of what we do, is we share. We, we're witnesses. We share, we look for those moments to say, I, I, this is why I'm doing it. I'm not just like an overgrown Boy Scout or something. You know, I'm, I, I don't have like a guilt complex I'm trying to work through. God did something in my life. God did something in my life. And I want to share that. Last verse, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. There's a reason. And he says, you give an answer that God's, he, notice he says, for the hope that you have. You don't have to answer every one of their questions. You don't have to live a perfect life. But you can give a reason. This is where I'm at. I'm in, you can just say, I'm in process. But here's what God's done in my life. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Well, I just want to take a moment here and just invite God's presence because as we talked about it, prayer is so important. This is a spiritual thing going on. And so, Lord, we just invite you right now into this, this, these next few moments. Lord, come help enlighten us. Let, we just invite the spirit of wisdom and revelation right here and right now. Lord, I pray that over every soul, every heart, every person, every mind online, everybody who's here. Some of you, as we went through the scale of the positive stuff, and some of you realize, hey, I'm kind of stuck there. Some of you need to belong. You need to get involved in a church. Some of you, hey, I need to start to, you know, discover what God's doing in my life. I need to take this growth track, I need, to, I need to, no more postponing, no more procrastinating. I need to take, I need to move forward in the next steps. Some of you realize, hey, I need to serve, I need to step up. And, and, and I really believe that God's going to do something powerful with Serve Day. So we want to pray for that. And then some of you, it's your moment to share. God will open that up. Lord, I pray for the Serve Day that's coming up. Open up opportunities. Lord, I pray that against the enemy who would try to sabotage our efforts with whether it's weather related or our or cars not working or something happening, a kid getting sick. We, Lord, I just pray that you protect our entire church as we are going to set aside those few hours next Saturday and serve together. Lord, I pray that new bonds are made friendship wise and that people would experience a touch of, of, of heaven through us. We get to be your ambassadors. Some of you also, when we looked at that scale, realized you had never really stepped across the line. Maybe you're receptive or you're seeking or you're, you're waiting for some understanding or maybe you're ready. And I certainly want to pray for I want to invite you right now because the Holy Spirit's in the process of this. Other people, it's not all about today. You know as well as me, people have planted, people have watered. The Holy Spirit's been drawing and speaking to you and revealing things. This is your moment. This is your time. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm just going to invite you. If that's you, if you're saying, you know what, I want to, I want to, I'm ready. I want to put my faith in Christ. I want to, I want to, maybe you're far from God for a long time. You knew, knew God when you were a kid or something. And you're saying, I want to come home and that's you, and you want to be included in the prayer, then without hesitation, I'm, going to, I'm not going to ask you to, to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to stand up where you're at, but I am going to, ask to let, I'm going to ask you to let me know I want to be included in that prayer so I know who to pray for, okay? So I'm going to ask you to do that just by raising your hand with every head bowed, every eye closed. Raise your hand if you're saying, I want to be included in that prayer. I want to put my faith in Christ today. Bless you, bless you, bless you. I see several all over here in the back. Yep, bless you over there in the, in the back also. 
all throughout the back, many, many hands. Anybody else? Say, I want to be included in that prayer over here on the side. Okay, put your hands down. I want to pray for you now, and I'm going to ask you to just under your breath, kind of, or just whisper or whatever's comfortable for you just to pray this prayer. Say, today, God, is my day. Would you do that? Today is my day. Today, I invite you into my life. Would you say, thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, for me. I want to have a relationship with you. You say, God, forgive me for trying to do it on my own. And would you say, I invite your Holy Spirit into my life. Help me walk this walk out and to do it with other people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.